All right, we are now live on Facebook. Good evening to everybody who is tuning in on Facebook and hello again to everybody who pre-registered and has joined us on Zoom for tonight's event. We are very excited to have David Carpenter from Redemption Whiskey on the line tonight. Uh, David is going to walk us through a presentation called American Whiskey with Redemption Whiskey. And we're gonna go through the history, a little bit of history of rye and bourbon. Uh, David is the Master Blender and Production Manager at Redemption, and we're so excited to have him tonight. Uh, also on the line, you have uh, me, Carol Ann, moderating for you, so please ask questions and I will share them with David and Mark. And speaking of Mark, we have the very talented, amazing spirits buyer on the line tonight, our own Mark Roy. So if you have any questions about anything tonight, please go ahead and leave a comment or on Facebook or leave a message in the chat here on Zoom. And I will make sure that those are shared with David and Mark. And David, we're so glad you're here. I'm gonna send things over to you. Let's go, let's taste, let's have some fun. Perfect, looking forward to it. Thank you very much for that. Just hop over here into our PowerPoint because you can't do a tasting without PowerPoint these days. People need something to look at and not just drink. We'll get that booted up here. There we go. All right, well, thank you all for joining in with us tonight. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to come along with you as we taste through a bit of American history uh, and just the different spirits that signify these different periods in history and as well as the story behind the products that I'm responsible for being the Redemption whiskey line, as well as may have a little surprise visit from a Bibb and Tucker Tennessee bourbon as well. But a bit of background on myself, Dave Carpenter, I've uh, been in the food and beverage industry for a little over 18 years now, and I was not always in whiskey, I actually started off as a chef, went through culinary school, did fine dining, French oak cuisine, a uh, little bit of anything and everything when it came to cooking. Uh, until I got married and found out I had to get a real job. But being an eighth generation Kentuckian, that wasn't too hard. I was able to take a lot of the skills that I learned in the kitchen when it comes to designing new recipes, flavor pairings, just sensory profiling of ingredients, and turn that into whiskey. And I've had a bit of family history with that, which we'll touch on here a little bit later in the presentation. But I'd invite you all to sip along with me as we go through these different uh, periods of American history. And this is going to be a general outline of what we're going through. It's a bit of the early days of when people were first coming over and first decided to take some grain that had potentially fermented and gone, maybe gone bad, they thought, distill it and start making whiskey with a, a grain that they were quite familiar with from the early days coming over. But as that moved west, we start getting a bit more of a, uh, a flavor revival. And then going on to working in the different products from around the area to create all kinds of new whiskeys to sip on, which we get to enjoy today, modern versions. This then becomes a, a heritage product here in the States before some other products start moving in on whiskey's territory and we have a bit of a battle going on. But that's gonna be a general ground we cover as well as the bottles we'll be sipping on tonight. But let's run it off. Early whiskey production in America. Uh, you'll see here in the picture, for those of you who haven't been before, this is down at Mount Vernon. This is going to be the Mount Vernon Distillery. Very well recreated stills there with the uh, traditional worm tub cooling. And I have to say, if you ever go don't go in the summertime because in that little brick building, once the steam starts going, it's uh, it gets a little muggy, I have to say. But unfortunately, our ancestors, this is what they had to deal with. Our settlers first coming over brought their beer making and whiskey making traditions with them. Uh, lots of my answers, the German, Swiss, Scots, Irish, they all came over, they all had their own fermented products, liqueurs, and in some cases, a bit of whiskey making that they were making along the way. And as they came over, they brought a lot of those traditions and that knowledge along with them. 
and I'm ever so thankful that they did. Uh, when they first came over, lots of beer. You know, you had, maybe the water wasn't the freshest. There was some extra grain around that they maybe weren't going to eat over the winter. When you've got a lot of extra grain, not only does it take up a lot of space and have a chance for spoilage, you want to sort of tidy it up a bit. So what they did, they make beer, take that beer, distill it in a nice uh, little copper alembic still, and you took what was hundreds of bushels of extra grain you weren't going to eat, that would have just gone bad, or just gone to the, the mice, and now you've turned it into a fairly good commodity. You've got much smaller package, takes a lot of grain, about 14 square foot of farmland to make one modern day bottle of whiskey. And it's not gonna go bad. If anything, it's just getting better, right? So that's what they were doing at this time. They were making whiskey as more of a uh, way to make ends meet, or in this case, rather than something just for fun and pure enjoyment. But a lot of those came over with the new settlers and their grain came with them. You had these guys from, or guys and gals coming from Germany, Scotland, Ireland, Switzerland, relatively cold, wet, short growing season. With that, you have rye. Rye really likes or grows best in a cold, damp environment and it doesn't need a super long growing season with lots of sun. Where we settled when we came over into this new nation, American Northeast, relatively cold, damp, short growing season. Uh, you've got Pennsylvania, big rye territory, New York, a lot of the same. So rye is what they were used to growing. It's what they decided to grow here in America as well. With that, they had lots of extra rye. Rye whiskey starts to take off. Not quite how we make it now. Uh, the rye whiskey that they were making back in this period would have been what we might consider young. Uh, and what I mean by that is you weren't really waiting around four years to drink the stuff. Uh, at this time in uh, American history, it could have been months old. Uh, not a whole lot of it was making it over a year, I wouldn't imagine, unless it really wasn't good. And at this point, you didn't have glass bottles quite a bit. What you would have done is you would have gone to either where the local distillery was or maybe a local shop at the time and they would have the barrel back behind the bar. You come in with a clay jug, hand it over and for a bit of money you'd be able to fill up your jug at the store or at the distillery and pack that on home. Not going to be super old, not going to have that nice dark amber color we've come to know and love, and probably a little prickly, a little spicy with that uh, younger age on it. But to give you an idea of how popular rye whiskey was, in 1799, shortly before his death, George Washington's distillery produced over 10,000 gallons of rye whiskey. It's just under 11,000 gallons. And at that time, it was the largest whiskey distillery in America. I think they knew what they were doing at that point, and obviously it was quite popular. They had a bit of drinking to do. But with that, it brings us over to our modern interpretation. Oh, and by the way, pay attention with some of these slides. You may be coming across some trivia questions that will be popping in towards the end of the presentation. So you might want to pay attention while you're also sipping. Both Redemption Rye, which I have here, we're going back to some of those older styles of rye whiskey making, what we started off making in this country, especially with the fact we're going very high rye. This is a 95% rye, 5% malted barley recipe. It doesn't get much higher than that. It's not quite 100, but it's getting there. There's just a little bit of barley in there, uh, the malted barley, with those enzymes in there to help us break down the starches that can be found in that rye grain to help get us a more yield, more sugars, which equals more alcohol. And rye is already pretty tricky, so we need a little bit of that barley in there. It is exceedingly hard to make at that 95%. At 95% rye, 
you run a risk of making, well, pancake batter, really. Within rye, there's a, a compound called beta-glucan. You start to think of it like beta-glucan, it acts like glue. It sticks things together and just makes this paste, almost an Elmer's glue at this point, if you don't cook it just right. So what we're doing is we're making sure we're not putting the rye in too hot. We're using enough enzyme from that malted barley to help break down those starches before they go all uh, battery on us. And we're making sure that we're getting in just enough time in the cooker, the proper rests to make sure that we're not trying to pump sludge through the pipes and instead we're pushing over this nice uh, ready to be fermented mash. Speaking of that mash, that mash is incredibly expensive at this recipe as well. Rye grain in general, pound for pound, is twice as expensive as corn. It's just uh, part of the farming processes. It's a bit more difficult, not as much yield, fewer people are growing it. So pound for pound, about twice as expensive. But then the rye grain itself actually has about this third as much starch as can be found in corn. So for that same pound to pound, you can make three times as much alcohol with that corn as you do with rye. So it's pound for pound, twice as expensive, and we're making a third as much. Really, it's kind of like making it six times more expensive for each pound of rye you're using in your recipe versus corn. But for the flavor we're getting, we're willing to do that. With Redemption Rye, we're gonna pay that little bit extra to get that premium rye flavor and be able to bring that to you and work it into your favorite cocktails. This is perfect for the modern day cocktail culture. Uh, you start thinking anything with a complicated name, uh, Vieux Carré, Boulevardier, uh, anything French really sounding, this Redemption Rye is gonna be perfect for it has these super big, bold, spicy flavors. Uh, you start thinking about caraway seed, clove, a uh, bit of allspice, uh, muddled spearmint even, We're all pulling through with this redemption rye. And that helps with making your perfect cocktail on that. You're not starting off with something that's super sweet. Uh, some bourbons with a very low rye content start off sweet. So when you start mixing in a sweet mixer, let's say, it becomes candy almost. Whereas this, we're starting off with something on the drier, spicier side. Working in that sweet mixer, we can achieve balance in that cocktail, as well as still be able to taste your whiskey. At that nice uh, 92 proof as well, that's letting it stand out against its uh, companions in that cocktail, let's say. Uh, we're not starting off at 80 proof. If we start off at 80 and we start mixing, it's only going down from there. By starting off at 92, we're able to give you some wiggle room when it comes to mixing and be able to still get a big, bold flavored cocktail. But please, if you haven't started already, dig right into that Redemption Rye. And at this point, just real quick, I'll see if we have any questions that have come in at this point as we've worked through very early history and Redemption Rye itself. David, we do. We have a couple of good questions. Um, so let's see, here on Zoom, Lisa would like to know what your thoughts are on the bourbon boom and the skyrocketing market for allocated bottles. <laughs> well, I have to say, I'm quite happy with the bourbon boom. Uh, I've been able to enjoy some great whiskey making uh, in this uh, modern boom that we have seen. And really it's only causing producers like us to find ways to increase our quality and really dig into what the customer is looking for. Because there is so much bourbon out there we need to be able to show that we're the right choice for that right occasion. Uh, speaking of right occasion, when it comes to allocation, um, I've always been of the idea that the whiskey that I make, the whiskey that I put in the bottle, 
I want it to be approachable. I want bottles to be in your hand with the top off rather than collecting dust behind a glass case, let's say. Now there's a time and a place for that. Uh, there are some bottles that we just flat out don't have enough of, unfortunately. Uh, there are some bottles that we make that I can't get my hands on, unfortunately. Uh, so I believe it has a time and a place, but um, I would much rather have bottles in hand, as I said, whiskey in glasses rather than behind glass. Awesome, thank you. And then another question here on Zoom. Uh, Tracy is wondering if Redemption products are vegan. Yes, uh, Redemption pro products are vegan. Um, we do not have anything in the process that would be an animal product or animal byproduct. Uh, we're not using, it's not like a Guinness where we're using an ice and glass for filtration. Uh, none of that. No, everything in it should be vegetarian, vegan friendly. Great. And then Robert would like to know if there are different types of rye grain that go into redemption. Aha, there are different types of rye grain. Uh, for the most part, where we're getting our rye is from those heritage locations that I talked about earlier. Um, we're talking about Germany and Sweden is where a lot of this specific rye that we're using for redemption is coming from. And that's because it has a a bigger, bolder, uh, more herbal flavor, at least to my palate. You start thinking of, uh, we go back to taxonomy or bi old biology classes from high school and college. Uh, you think of a bell pepper. Taxonomically, Latin genus and species, you're looking at capsicum annuum, genus species. Then you look at a serrano chili. Genus and species, it is also capsicum annuum. So the same. When it comes down to is next is below that is the varietal. This is where you have bell pepper versus serrano. Completely different flavor, even though they're both the same species. Similar thing with rye. The rye that we have coming over from this you know, Germanic, Swedish nature is a slightly different variety to that is being grown in, say, the Pacific Northwest, uh, Canada and Oregon, Washington, where a lot of American rye is grown. The Swedish Germanic, you're looking a bit more of this herbal uh, baking spice type character that is picking up, that's uh, being broken down by the yeasts. Whereas the Pacific Northwest rye, I get a bit more of a, a bready nature. It's a bit more muted, uh, maybe a bit more peppery at times, but more like uh, rye bread without the caraway seed. Whereas you know, the other varieties that we're using for redemption have this uh, bigger punch, let's say pound for pound. Hopefully that makes sense. That was great, David. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And speaking of rye, I think if we're ready to go ahead, we've got a little bit of a switch up when it comes to the grain that we're using. Let's do it. Perfect. Moving right along. Production moves west. So after getting fed up with the uh, cold and damp northeast, we're starting to move down. We start moving into more my part of the world, you know, God's country, Kentucky. Uh, back then it would have been Virginia though. Uh, wouldn't become Kentucky until a little bit later. But this is where bourbon really starts to get produced. Once you get down here towards Kentucky, Tennessee line, uh, uh, Virginia as well for that matter, rye doesn't grow as well. Uh, it gets a bit too hot, not quite enough rain. The growing season might be a bit too long even. It can go dry in the field pretty quick if you're not careful. And corn, on the other hand, grows real well. Uh, this is where it's, it's meant to be, really. So you see the amount of rye in your recipe coming down and the amount of corn coming up. Uh, not that that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a different thing. Uh, I drink just as much bourbon as I do rye whiskey. Uh, each has their time and place. 
And now we really start to mess around a lot with the different mash bills, the grain part of the recipes. And you start seeing some abbreviations like what you see on the slide there, like a 60364 or an 8488. Those types of recipes become a bit more popular in that this is a breakdown of primary grain, in this case, corn for bourbon being that first number. Your second digit is going to be your flavor grain, which we're gonna to touch on here in a second. And then that last digit is going to be the amount of malted barley in your recipe or your mash bill. So that 30, 60, 36, four, that's going to be 60% corn, 36% rye in this case, and 4% malted barley. That's be a pretty good rye content for a bourbon coming out of Kentucky, higher than normal, really. And then you see something like an 8488. Very traditional, very well-known mash bill coming out of Tennessee. Looking at 84% corn, much higher content, just 8% rye, pretty low. And then a bit more barley, 8% barley, more corn, more starch. We need to increase the amount of barley just to get more enzymes to help break down that extra starch in there. But that middle number is where it really gets interesting. The thing with that is that flavor grain, traditionally, it is either going to be rye or wheat, one or the other. Uh, rye is going to be a bit more traditional, but wheat is not unheard of, uh, even going way back. Uh, historically, this would have just been decided based on what you had, what was practical to get or what you were able to grow yourself. And this is where a bit of my family history comes down. Uh, there at the bottom, with the uh, bit more of a grayish paper there, you're gonna see a receipt uh, that's housed here in Kentucky at the Kentucky Historical Archives. And it is a receipt of a land rentor uh, paying their bill to one of my family's ancestors, uh, Adam Carpenter. Uh, and he's paying for the use of that land that was held by Adam Carpenter uh, with barrels of corn. Uh, in this case, looking at uh, pay to the said Carpenter the quantity of 52 barrels of good sound corn in 1802. Not many families are gonna be able to eat 52 barrels of dry corn in one go. So this gives us a bit of a hint. Well, if they're paying in you know, 50 some odd barrels of dry corn, this is being used for distilling. Uh, like I said, no one's gonna eat that much in any speedy amount of time. So even here, someone is being able to pay for renting their land in future bourbon goods, bourbon ingredients, which then goes into what you have on the left there. Also housed here at the capital of Kentucky in Frankfurt, the Kentucky Historical Archives. This is my sixth great aunt's sour mash bourbon recipe. Sour mash on one side, flip that piece of paper over and it's a sweet mash on the other. Uh, the title of this is Receipt for Distilling by a Sour Mash. With this, you're looking at the oldest known uh, sour mash whiskey recipe in this country. And it's dated May 18th, 1818. Pretty easy for me to remember, it's a bunch of 18s. But you also heard right, this is a recipe by Catherine Spears Fry Carpenter, uh, written down by a woman. And this recipe does not specify you must use rye, you must use wheat. It says rye or wheat in that recipe. There's no and in there, it's not and or. So you see some uh, four grain bourbons uh, on the market today, so maybe not historically accurate, but in this case, uh, back in 1818, even back that far, it was rye or wheat. They were fine with either, it's just what you had, what was available or practical. Um, and it's not just the ingredients that determined what they were making at the time. It was also their methods. Uh, when it came to summertime, not a whole lot of distilling going on. A, the corn may not be quite ripe yet, 
but also it's just too dang hot for fermentation. Something to watch out for. And as you read recipes like this, or as I've gone through them, they also didn't have a whole lot of thermometers. So when they're looking at cooking in the fall, fall distillation of the fall harvest, a lot of their temperatures are written down in something like how far you can put your hand into the mash. If it's just the fingers, you know, it's, it's pretty hot. But they talk about being uh, bearable up to the wrist. If it's being able to put your hand into the mash up to your wrist means it's pretty cold. And that was a measurement before putting their yeast in. Because once you get above 90 degrees, uh, your yeast can become stressed out and die. So if it's at least wrist bearable, your yeast will probably survive as well. That's a fun little bit of uh, digging we've been able to do in these old recipes. And it also comes down to the method of even mixing. We've made historical, historically accurate, relatively, uh, reproductions of this exact recipe and found out that it's incredibly thin. That's because back in this time, it's all hand stirring. No modern motorized agitators of today, where we use a lot more grain per gallon of water. So we found all kinds of different uh, historical finds in these old recipes that are sadly too far and few between. But we have historical precedents for rye versus wheat. And as you can see in that receipt for 52 barrels of corn, the rise of corn as a commodity and increase in bourbon production. Which brings us to redemption weeded bourbon. Now I mentioned that you could use corn as your first number, then your flavor grain, then typically malted barley. In this case, we wanted maximum wheat character. We weren't gonna make a weeded bourbon with just you know 10% wheat. In this case, we maxed it out and it's barely legal bourbon, you could say, in that by law, uh, bourbon must be made out of a minimum of 51% corn. So we did just that, the minimum. And then the rest of it maxed out as much wheat as possible while still keeping a little bit of that malted barley in there, once again, to help us break down the starches. So it is still bourbon, but maximum, maximum wheat. And earlier when I mentioned rye, I said that that has that rye spice. When I think wheat, I think sweet. It has this, uh, you know, bakery fresh character to it. You think rye bread, cornbread, wheat bread. Uh, wheat bread, you get these toasted notes. You get these uh, almost a pastry feel at times when it comes to that flavor. And in general, it doesn't have that pepperiness of the rye. Instead, you have this sweet coating, more nuanced approach. Uh, sometimes I've heard people compare a high wheat bourbon as being a bit closer to a, a Scotch or an Irish whiskey and how light the palate can be at times. And I have to say, as a general rule, you're not gonna see many weeded bourbons with this much wheat in it. Uh, coming out of this, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee area, uh, most bourbons are going to have closer to about 20% wheat. We're just, you know, double that and call it a day on a redemption weeded. That's, like I said, you won't see that too often. But earlier I talked about the balance that rye provides. And in this case, corn is sweet, wheat is sweet. So we needed another way to create balance in the whiskey. In this case, we did it with the proof. The rye, you had a 92 proof, nice even keeled, maybe a little bit higher than average. With Redemption Weeded, we're up to 96. Just ticking that dial up a little bit just to help create a bit more heat, a bit more body to balance out the sweetness of that 45% wheat. And that's really my goal when creating these blends uh, of the weeded in particular, is getting nuance, balance, uh, and not being just completely washed out in a sweet wheat, you could say. 
Uh, and there is a bit of a floral quality that comes across as well, especially if you take this, a few drops of water, it'll really open up, get almost uh, sometimes a bit of uh, lavender or honeysuckle pulling through, which is a, a, I'm a big fan of personally. But when it comes to a, a weeded bourbon, this is gonna be one of those ones that, while harder to get, is still going to be available uh, and on your shelf. And I'm very happy to be sharing it with you all. But speaking of that weeded bourbon, do we have any other questions coming in? We covered a, a bit of ground there when it came to moving west. Yeah, David, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so Paul is wondering what the difference between sour mash, uh, sorry, I read that wrong. What's mm -hmm. the difference between sour mash and straight bourbon? Ah, uh -huh. you're kind of, with that, you're kind of talking about apples and oranges. So there's two different things with, well, kind of, you could have a straight sour mash bourbon. In fact, if you've had a Kentucky bourbon, most likely it was a straight sour mash bourbon. Uh, what sour mash means is we have taken a little bit of the previous batch, specifically the slop uh, or the uh, back set. What I mean by that is once we go through the still, you know, the alcohol has been removed, but we still have a bit of the water and the grain left over. And it's this big grainy water or slurry that we call back set or slop. We've heard of slopping the pigs. This is what would be fed to your cattle or your pigs as a low carbohydrate, high protein feed that you could mix in with your silage, like your uh, hay, straw, things of that nature. But if you take the grain out and you're left with that water that's left over from the distillation process, that is going to be our thin slop or our back set. We'll take some of that and add it to the next fermenting batch. It helps to bring down the pH. It's uh, pretty acidic already. It's part of the fermentation process. We have these different uh, bacteria, like a lactobacillus that will get in there and acidify the mash. And that low pH is still present after distillation. So we'll take that, add it to our new batch and yeast prefer a lower, uh, a lower pH, more acidic home to be in. So in this case, we're looking at around 5.4 is a pretty happy pH for yeast. So by pre-souring the mash, we're making happier yeast, better fermentation, more consistent fermentation. So that is a sour mash versus a sweet mash where we're not adding that extra back set. It's just fresh water, fresh grain every time. Straight bourbon is a legal definition within the United States uh, codified by the TTB, the uh, Tax and Trade Bureau, that says that for a straight whiskey to exist, it has to have been aged for a minimum of two years in new charred oak barrels. And then it also cannot have any additives or flavorings put in, uh, neutral colorings or flavorings. So with that, if it says straight on the label, you know that they haven't put any artificial coloring, no caramel coloring, E150A. Uh, also no artificial flavorings like uh, sugar or anything like that. Uh, and if it says bourbon, no, you're not allowed to put those things in anyway, but we still like to put straight on the label. So you can have a straight sour mash bourbon and you can have a straight sweet mash bourbon. But just because it doesn't say sour mash on the label doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't sour mash. Just some brands advertise it more often than others. Uh, for example, on Redemption Weeded, it is a sour mash bourbon. We just don't have it on the label. So hopefully that helps clear up a little bit on the differences between those two. That was great, David. We have two more questions before we let you move on. Uh, somebody watching on Facebook would like to know, does the soil type in the different geographic regions have an influence on the flavor components of rye? Uh, I absolutely believe it can. Yes, uh, you, the grain will be 
sort of like grape vines, but not quite as much so in that if there's a bit more stress, there may be less starch produced, smaller kernels, uh, less rainfall. Once again, smaller kernels, uh, more, or more stress, but more concentrated flavor. I wouldn't put it up to being as important as it is with grape production for wines, but it is definitely there. Just the soil, the minerality, uh, how stressed the uh, grain is will make a difference uh, of greater or lesser degree. Awesome. And then this last question before I move on is related, kind of related to the weeded bourbon. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody would like to know if you have plans to make uh, a, a weeded whiskey with more than 50% wheat. Aha, uh -huh. that's an excellent question. Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, we won't, I say we won't uh, hold our cards to close to the chest here. We are constantly innovating. We're constantly working on new recipes, new products. Uh, I will never be bored. That's uh, a given. Uh, but yes, if we were to increase that wheat to that minimum of 51%, we would have a weeded whiskey or a wheat whiskey, uh, which we do not currently have in bottle, but that is not to say that we won't make any in future or don't have any in barrels. Awesome, thank you, David. Now, I mean, if, you need, to tell us, if you need to tell us any trade secrets while we have you on the line tonight, don't worry, we can be trusted. Oh, I, I made sure to pull down all of my uh, notes and charts before we uh, got too far into the night. Uh. <laughs> I have a little, little sneaky stuff going on. But speaking of sneaky and rhyming, we're at least going to go whiskeys, neat indies. So when it came to spirits consumption in early America, it wasn't quite whiskey. Rum was key. Uh, you all say rum was king. Uh, they were drinking more rum than whiskey starting off. Uh, first of all, they didn't have to make it. It could just be shipped in. And they went through quite a bit. Uh, you're looking at 3.7 gallons per person uh, going into the American Revolution. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't drink that much rum uh, now. I don't know that I've had 3.7 gallons of rum in my life, but they went through quite a bit of it. And when they did, those barrels needed somewhere to go. Now, barrels were used for everything back then. They were the IBC totes, the poly drums uh, of their day, in that once you were done with that barrel, uh, you weren't just going to let it sit there. You weren't going to let it rot. So you might use it for, well, pickle storage, nail storage, fish, uh, rainwater, maybe for holding slop for the pigs. Maybe cut it in half and use it as a feed trough. They were used for anything and everything, up to and including taking a used drum barrel and using it for whiskey. Everyone needed barrels uh, when it came to making whiskey. And if there's one pre-made that they didn't have to go out and pay premium prices for a Cooper to make a, a brand new one, they're happy to use a used one. In this case with the rum, it's adding quite a bit more flavor in there than what you might expect at first. It's not just an, a neutral oak container. There's still some rum left inside the oak of that barrel, just trapped inside the grain. And if you're able to dump that barrel relatively fresh and not let that rum evaporate away, if you were to put whiskey in behind it, over the years or months even, that whiskey is going to push itself into the wood, pick up some of that rum and pull it back into itself when it cools back down. Just that barrel breeze a little bit as it gets hot, cold, hot, cold. Uh, especially around here, we've got, you know, you could be low 80s at midday and down into the low 50s at night. That warming up and cooling down just really pushes into that wood and starts leaching some of that previous product back into your new one. 
and we're doing that again today. Uh, you see it a lot, a lot, a lot in the scotch industry uh, where they're not using just rum barrels. They're also using port, sherry. Uh, you've got uh, tequila is on the menu now, used tequila barrels. And the American whiskey trade is right behind them. We're working into saying who can come up with the, uh, you know, the most bizarre barrel coming up next is uh, what well, you see beer, beer barrels are all over the place. The hoppiest IPA you can imagine, you know, throw a whiskey in that barrel, we'll see what happens. And it's a way for us to innovate, but at the same time, we're doing just what people were doing, you know, way back when. It's not really that new. Uh, nothing went to waste. And it's a new cycle coming around. But when it comes to rum casks, what you're seeing on the screen there is, that's one of mine. Uh, myself, Redemption, we've gone through and partnered up with Plantation Rum, and I got some of the barrels. Those barrels actually started off as cognac casks over in France before going over to the Indies, you're looking at uh, Barbados and Jamaica in particular, uh, filled with rum. And then once they're done with rum making, they came over to me being shipped over here into Kentucky, Indiana. And we decided to put rye whiskey in there. So just like that first bottle we had of Redemption Rye Whiskey, same liquid, However, a little bit older, and then going into these plantation rum casks, and we end up with Redemption Rum Cask Finish. It's the first in our cask series. And I have to say, I'm a, a, a bit of a fan on this one. As you can see, this one's not full. Uh, I can't help myself. So it's still rye whiskey, but it's got a little bit more to it. Um, and with this, we had barrels from Jamaica and barrels from Barbados. The barrels from Jamaica, uh, the type of rum they make down there, they experiment with what are called dunder pits, which is a little bit of an extra fermentation that they go through. And it adds this uh, earthy, sort of a, a fruity funk to their rum for better, uh, or lack of better words. And we're taking that, and then we're balancing that out with this super sweet blackstrap molasses style of rum making down in Barbados. So it's a little bit of an earthy funk, this super sweet, almost a honeyed rum, taking those and adding their styles to our 95% rye whiskey. This big, bold, uh, spicy herbal bomb is then getting rounded out, sort of the the corners are just getting rounded over from that spicy rye. And the little bit of floral sweetness coming in from the rum cask is just uh, sort of that salt and pepper over the top of your steak. It's the salt and pepper for our rye whiskey in this case. And to maximize that punch, this whiskey is non-chill filtered. What I mean by that is most whiskey these days we will take it, make it very cold, which can make some of these uh, oils or fatty acid esters, they will go cloudy. We'll then pump that now chilled, like, you know, 15 degrees, slightly cloudy whiskey, pump it through some cellulose plates and those oily characteristics that were causing it to cloud up will stick to those cellulose plates, be stripped out, and our bright crystal clear, well not clear, it's still brown, but a non-cloudy whiskey continues on. That is chill filtration. And the reason we do that is customers don't really like to see a bottle of whiskey that's cloudy, um, or it may have like a sediment down in the bottom, which can happen if you don't chill filter. And for just shelf stability and appearance reasons, in the industry, we have cho chosen to mostly chill filter whiskey. That's uh, industry-wide. However, when you do that, 
those uh, oils and esters that you're filtering out, that's flavor. And we're sort of leaving it on the table a bit. So when it comes to something really special, something that we want to maximize that nuance and maximize the flavor, we, it'll be non-chill filtered. We will not chill filter it. We're taking a risk that it might go hazy or it might look a little bit cloudy when you pour it on ice. Or if you were to say, throw this bottle in your freezer, uh, I know who you are, um, but we're getting maximum flavor and it's worth it uh, for me, especially on this one to really get those bright nuanced floral notes from those rum casks and bringing it to our rye whiskey. And this is a process that will change over the years because we're taking a little bit from each batch and adding it into the next one to further increase that uh, nuance and character of this blend. So a little bit of batch one went into batch two, a little bit of batch two will go into batch three. So it's a sort of a pseudo Solera style of aging where once we get into batch 10, there will still be a little bit of batch one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine in batch 10. It will continue to develop complexity. But my favorite notes coming out of this whiskey in particular with that rum cast finish, is we're still getting the caraway seed from that rye, redemption rye, because it is still predominantly rye. Uh, we spend that extra time, extra money, extra effort to make a really good rye whiskey. I still want it to taste like rye whiskey. But we've added a little bit this these tropical notes, this coconut, guava, passion fruit. And once again, just seasoned it a little bit instead of being dominant. There are some rum cask finished whiskeys out in the market today that to me taste more like rum than they do whiskey. And that's not what I wanted to go with. I wanted big, bold rye, but just sort of a little bit of icing on top just to make it just that bit more of a Moorish character to it. But very happy with how rum cask is going for now. I'm working on batch three and I'm looking forward to sharing it as well. But now that we've gone down to the Indies with our whiskeys, Anyone have any questions for me? Yes. So uh, we've got a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody would like us to start trivia. So I think we'll, we'll do we'll we'll move on to our trivia in just a couple okay. minutes, guys. Don't you worry. We've got some gift cards to give away, but a couple more questions first. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody would was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the Solera aging process. Ah, uh, so Solera aging you see a lot in uh, sherry. Uh, the sherry bodegas and what they'll do is they'll have racks of barrels you know, rack of barrels one two three four five six seven eight nine rack of barrels rack of barrels rack of barrels you've got your oldest barrels on the bottom and sort of younger barrels on top and in the solera system you're pulling finished product finished sherry or in our case finished whiskey from those bottom barrels which then leaves but you're not emptying the barrels. You're pulling out maybe, you know, a third. Then the barrels above that, some is taking out of them to fill the bottom barrels. Some is taking out of the third rack into the second rack, fourth rack into the third rack, so on until you end up with your top barrels, which are about one third empty. And they will get topped up with new sherry or in our case, like new rye. That will continue to age for another you know, months to years. And once again, you will pull finished whiskey or finished sherry from those bottom barrels again, and then just continue topping up. And by doing that, by never emptying those bottom barrels, it will constantly be gaining in age over time, depending on how fast or how frequently you're pulling spirit from those bottom barrels but it will continue to have a mix of ages and a, you know, a mix of batches as this whiskey or sherry continues to filter down to that bottom barrel for your finished product. And it makes for a blending process that takes years instead of seconds. 
And that's what we're trying to imitate here with our rum cask finished rye for redemption is taking a little bit of each batch is held over for the next batch and going in and we'll continue that process moving forward. And uh, it gives you a bit of an idea of how we are sort of imitating that Solera system without having a, you know, the barrels physically racked on top of each other and never fully emptying them. Hopefully that makes sense. Cool. Uh, so this next question, Mark, you're up. So the people of the internet want to know if rum, uh, Redemption Rum Cask is a regular offering in our stores or if it's only available at select locations. Well, that's a good question. Currently it is, uh, as David uh, stated, he's working on the next uh, release. So uh, the release that we have now is a one-time buy. Uh, we have about 75 cases out in select stores. Uh, it's uh, New Hampshire code number 5389. So if you go on liquorandwineoutlets.com and punch that in the search bar, it will bring up uh, which stores have it and how many bottles. And it is currently retailing for $49.99. Uh, David and I were chatting a little bit before we went live, and I did mention to him um, I've had the opportunity, as you can imagine, to taste quite a few uh, spirits over the years. And uh, this is one of my top five uh, if not top three uh, favorite uh, rye whiskeys that I've tried. So I certainly highly recommend it. You know, that what he talked about flavor-wise and the finish, incredible on this one. So go out and grab one where you can. And Mark, the Good. weeded is in test right now, right? At select locations? Correct. The weeded bourbon is out in test locations. It's on sale for $44.99. So that's in 36 of our uh, largest locations throughout the state. Uh, also, New Hampshire code number 5310. So uh, you can get that more readily in a, a wider range and bigger selection, but uh, I recommend getting one of those and one of the rum cast finish. So <laughs> you've got options. All right, David, what do you think? Should it be trivia time? I think we can skip ahead to a bit of trivia. What do you think? I think so. Okay. All right, okay. everyone. So here's how it's going to go. David is going to ask you the trivia questions, and I am going to be monitoring for the correct answer here on Zoom. So for those of you watching on Facebook, if you'd like to be eligible for future trivia uh, giveaways during our 90 days events, please pre-register. Uh, you can pre-register on our Eventbrite page. I will share the link out in the comments. Um, so tonight we are giving away some gift cards to our stores. So I've got my chat open. I am ready to watch. David, it's all yours. Okay. Instead of uh, skipping through the presentation, I'll tell you what, I've got at least the first few memorized here. Uh, so for the first one, in 1799, who was producing the most rye whiskey in America? Looking for a person's name. Oh, I've got first response, George Washington. Ding, ding, ding. Tracy, it is your week, girl. <laughs> Tracy won a barrel head last night too. She is quick with her trivia. Well, there you go. All right, All Tracy, right. we will get you a gift card in the mail. All right, are we good for a second trivia question? Yeah, let's do a second before we continue there we with go. the presentation. We'll get two in. So for this one, what year is on the oldest known sour mash whiskey recipe? Is it 1881? It is not. Is it 1818? It is. Mark Wise, you are wise and you are our <laughs> second winner. There you go. 1818, May 18th, 1818. Great. Oh, this is so fun. I love watching you guys. You're all so <laughs> fast. Some fast typers. All right, so I think we can continue with the presentation, save those last couple of questions for the end. There you go. You guys also need to still stick around for my code word, which I'll have for you in a little while. 
All right, coming up next, getting into a bit of heritage. Whiskey grows up through generations and generations. So once again, in my part of the world, the settled frontier, especially in Kentucky and Tennessee, whiskey became a staple. It became a heritage cottage industry, you could say. Uh, we ended up having whole families, or it wasn't just one person distilled and the kids moved on. The kids started to take on the mantle. And you had what was just a little farm distillery where the farm was just taking their excess grain and making a whiskey out of it. Now it became the farm exists to make whiskey instead of the other way around. Now we're growing grain specifically for whiskey making instead of just uh, what we wanted to eat that year. And as generations came along, we really started to shape and mold our whiskey styles and our regional characteristics. Uh, this went on up until the Industrial Revolution. The industry really modernized how we make whiskey today. We're not standing around with you know, paddles and sticks stirring the grain. Uh, we start getting into motors and uh, you know, different gear ratios for increasing the speed. We've got pumps coming along, uh, more efficient means of using steam for cooking and for distillation and not just direct fire. So not only can we make better whiskey, but we can make a whole lot more of it uh, in less time. And this leads to a boom in whiskey making. And uh, on a personal note, we still have a bit of this multiple generation thing going on today. Uh, distillery I used to work inside of, uh, there's a gentleman named Butch who ran the stills. And when I was there, Butch had been running those stills for, if I remember correctly, uh, he's going on uh, 14, 15 years. And his mother had sat in that exact same chair running those same stills for over 20 years before that. So we have this institutionalized knowledge that starts to get built up in uh, especially this area of the world that we have to hold on to moving forward and make sure we don't lose it all. We're getting these uh, old timers going through and sharing their knowledge with us so that this industry continues to grow and we don't lose that information. And one of those things that really threatened our institutional knowledge of whiskey making was the Volstead Act, uh, Prohibition Act. Uh, this came out in 1919 and it drives production underground. Uh, this is a big problem for the time, especially for these farmers who had switched from making food crops to making whiskey crops. And now all of a sudden uh, they're not allowed to do that anymore. But you also had some really big distilleries who had warehouses full of thousands, tens of thousands of barrels and nowhere to sell it. And this really causes a huge shift in how we made whiskey. So at this time, rye was still our favorite whiskey. We were still making loads and loads and loads of risky, uh, risky. Risky whiskey, you got that rye whiskey being made. That's what our nation was founded on. You start thinking of all of the most famous cocktails, old fashioned, the Manhattan, those were originally formulated with rye whiskey, not bourbon. But I mentioned at the very beginning that rye is more expensive. It can be troublesome to work with, those the beta glucans that can cause it to gum up. And then you make less whiskey pound for pound. There's less starch in it compared to corn. So once distillation and whiskey production becomes illegal, you wanna make whiskey cheap, easy, and fast and in large quantities. Those are three things that just aren't rye. So now you see the amount of rye in your recipe coming down and the amount of corn going up with prohibition. Because corn, 
tons of extra starch for making more whiskey per run. It's cheap. We had you know, whole barns full of it, silos full of it. It was these uh, farmers that had gone through and developed their farm specifically around whiskey making. And yeah, that also made it cheap and it's easy to work with. It doesn't gum up the works like that rye does. So now rye starts to fade, bourbon comes into its own. And one of those areas you see bourbon coming into its own is Tennessee. And that brings us to our Bib and Tucker, six-year-old Tennessee bourbon. And yes, I said that correctly, Tennessee bourbon. We'll cover that here in a second, why? Now on this bottle of Bib and Tucker, you're gonna see prominently focused here on the label, aged six years. Interesting part of how our legal system codifies the age that you're allowed to say on a whiskey label here in the States. By regulation, we can only claim the youngest drop in the bottle. So in this case, aged six years, that doesn't mean all of the whiskey in that bottle is six years old. I'll give you a hint, in, the, in our case, it's much older. Uh, for mm -hmm. this Bibb and Tucker six year, this is actually a blend of barrels ranging from mm -hmm. a minimum six years of old upwards of nine years of age. And got that spread in between. And you could give another example of say you had 100 barrels of 12 year old whiskey and you put in you know, a glass of six year, on the label, legally, you're not allowed to claim more than six years old for the entire batch. So that's why we have six years on here. The average age is significantly older, going from six to that nine in the blend itself. So even though it says six, it's gonna taste like older than six is what I'm getting to with that. This one, we're really getting big, bold characters. Uh, that you'll be familiar with, with Tennessee bourbon or Tennessee whiskey. And this is charcoal filtered, where we take our new make spirit and drip it through a bed of sugar maple charcoal before it goes into the barrel. And what that does is we're pulling out, we're filtering out um, a bit of some of those, some might say rougher edged flavors that normally we might just wait uh, longer for it to age out or oxidize. In this case, we're just getting it out of the way immediately. And it creates for a, you could say a sweeter whiskey. And at the same time, it's one that has this more like a, a silky mouthfeel to it as well. As some of these uh, oils get filtered out early on. And a lot of people start arguing about whether or not is bourbon or is Tennessee whiskey bourbon. And Legally, yes, that's why we're calling this Tennessee bourbon. Uh, Tennessee whiskey traditionally is made with that charcoal filtered process before it goes into the barrel. And the reason that's still bourbon is Tennessee whiskeys that you're seeing, they still have that minimum 51% corn. And one of the laws surrounding bourbon we mentioned with the word straight is that you can't have any added colorings, flavorings, besides what is attributed to the distillation and maturation process. And a lot of people say that charcoal filtering of Tennessee whiskey means it's not bourbon because of that. No added colorings or flavorings besides what is attributed to the distillation or maturation process. Filtering, by definition, is a reductive process, not an additive process. We're taking away something instead of putting it in. And because of this, it is still bourbon. That's why we just went ahead and flat out said it on the label, Tennessee bourbon. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can ask the master distiller down at Jack Daniels, he says the same thing. But with our Tennessee bourbon here, we have these big, much older flavors than what is reflected on the label, but we're also using fairly unique barrels. When you have a bourbon barrel, you have to char the inside. You have to burn the inside to charcoal. Uh, one of those regulations, new charred oak container. However, there are different levels that you can char it. You can go really light 
which would be a number one char, or you can go pretty heavy, which would be a number four char. Most bourbons are in that three to four char range. With Bibb and Tucker, a lot of our whiskey going in here is going to be in char one, a lighter charred barrel. What that does, it's uh, more of a toasted barrel than a charred barrel, almost like a wine barrel in that sense, in that we haven't just burnt it to a crisp, which does bring out a lot more of your vanillas and caramels and your traditional bourbon notes. But with a char one, char two, your lighter chars, you're bringing out this big uh, nutty characteristic, uh, this toasted characteristic. Um, I especially like to say it's you know pecan pie in a bottle, or you get these roasted chestnuts, pecan pie, sweet kettle corn, a bit of hay or straw coming through as well because of that lighter char on the barrels that isn't just uh, completely, you know, alligator charring the inside. We're getting that toasted note in there as well, which really helps to set it apart. And in particular with Bib and Tucker, going to those lighter char barrels, it's all being distilled right now down in Columbia, Tennessee. Uh, very rural, you know, small uh, town, uh, just about say 45 minutes south of Nashville. And all of the corn is coming from within 60 miles of the distillery. So you talk about, you know, cottage industry and going with the locals and what's found in the local area. All of the corn for this one are within 60 miles of the distillery. And yeah, I may, I may be an eighth generation Kentuckian, but I still have to say uh, for being made in Tennessee, it's, it's damn good whiskey. But with that, with the Bibb and Tucker, please feel free. I'd love to have any other questions you have on that one. And uh, at, it is a deep favorite of mine. We're going south of the border anyway. Awesome. So David, we do have a couple other questions. Uh, which rye, wheat, maize, barley variation are your preference to work with? Mm. I am a fan of a lot of rye, um, especially once you start getting above 20%, you start getting up into yeah, you know, mid 20s to mid 30s percent rye. Big, big fan. Big, bold flavors uh, with just enough of that corn just to help uh, even it out. That's gonna be a big one. But I'm also, uh, I'm partial to malt. Uh, I like playing around with the balance that the malt flavors can bring, uh, especially in a, a, a rye whiskey to once again, take some of that rye spice and just temper it some with a bit more malt that can really bring out this more of a, a grassy, uh, you know, fresh hay note to it uh, that you can't find with a, you know, without that malted barley in there. But yeah, I have a tendency towards rye, strong flavors. Awesome. And then Scott on Facebook wants to know if you can talk about your yeast usage and the profiles that they bring to your spirits. Mm. Yeah, so with the Redemption line, we're using one yeast. With Bibb and Tucker, it's a separate one. With the Bibb and Tucker yeast, this is going to be, I'll say a much uh, more a cleaner profile to start out with, which really lets the barrel take charge. Uh, with the yeast that we're using, it's not throwing off as many of these more like fruity esters that you might be seeing more in that rye whiskey from Redemption. And we really wanted that focus to be on the barrel. So especially with that extra time in barrel, you know, six to nine years on this one, by having a more neutral yeast, maybe fermenting a little bit cooler to help with that process, we're just really maximizing the barrel addition to the flavor profile, like the, that pecan pie chestnuts characteristic. With Redemption, we're using a yeast that really likes to pump out these strong flavors, uh, especially these uh, more herbal ones. Um, my favorite compound that this whiskey strain we use pumps out is called Carvone, uh, C-A-R-V-O-N-E. And Carvone is a flavor compound that you will find in dill seed, spearmint, uh, caraway seed, a lot of these same flavors that you would find in like a, a seeded rye bread. And 
that carbone is also found inside of the rye we're using. And our yeast strain that we're using is helping to maximize that output and just getting as much of that big herbal spicy flavor as possible. Whereas the Bib and Tucker yeast strain, a bit more neutral, a bit more subdued to let the barrel shine. Awesome, thank you, David. Absolutely. So a couple of people have asked what our code word is for tonight. So I'm gonna tell you, and it's a word that you have heard a lot tonight. So are you ready? It's redemption. <laughs> so be sure to enter that into your Scavify app to earn hundred points for attending tonight's event. Uh, this is a little bit, David has some more for us. Mm -hmm. So now you have your code word, but stay tuned because we still have more trivia coming up. I've got one more whiskey and then three more trivia questions for you. All right. Now that's not whiskey, but it's pertinent, unfortunately. Uh, once we got past prohibition, once we got past the Volstead Act and we were finally able to, through the 21st Amendment, bring whiskey back in, started back up, making more. After a couple decades of that, all of a sudden whiskey kind of falls out of favor. And when we were drinking, what at the time was, you know, three, four, five years old, all of a sudden whiskey's sitting in barrel a lot longer. And one of the people we have to blame for that is vodka, boring vodka, or in this case, Bond, James Bond. You saw the rise of clear spirits in the 60s and 70s. In particular, vodka and gin. Um, the James Bond years were not kind to whiskey. Uh, it became to be seen as a bit of granddad's drink uh, back from the, the Mad Men eras of, of the 50s. And since whiskey wasn't selling and these all these clear spirits were, well, there was no point in bottling it if it's not selling. So we'll just leave it in the barrel and try to wait it out. So whiskey is staying in the barrel longer and longer and longer than it ever had before, really. Uh, eventually, it got to the point where the whiskey was coming of age. They didn't want it to get any more oak or any older. So they practically gave it away. It was commodity whiskey at this point. Uh, you had... At this point, the rise of the porcelain decanter. I'm sure you've seen them flying around there. You see some of the uh, Ezra Brooks. Uh, Jim Beam was going to be the one of the biggest people at this time to come out with a whole line of collectible china and porcelain decanters that they're using as a almost a gimmick to get rid of whiskey. Uh, you weren't really buying the whiskey at this point. You were buying the collectible decanter that it's... Uh, got the whiskey just stored in. Um, I have more than a few of them. I grew up uh, in my grandfather's basement in Lexington, Kentucky, and lining his basement walls were old Jim Beam decanters, you know, cats, horses, birds, uh, special decanter for the 100th running of the Kentucky Derby. There were ways of getting rid of this whiskey, but you weren't really buying the whiskey, as I said. At this point, they were just trying to get whiskey out of barrels and out into market now with any method they could. This was, yeah, it became granddad's drink throughout the 60s and 70s while we still had vodka and gin clear spirits that weren't having to wait three or four years in barrel. You could make it today and sell it tomorrow, really. Which brings us to the oldest offering on the table there. And at barrel proof at that. So what I mean by that, older, we're approaching a decade. Redemption barrel proof, nine year bourbon. Now, remember I said youngest drop, right? The youngest drop is nine years old. This batch in particular is going to be a blend of nine to 12 year old barrels. Super rich flavors, concentrated flavors and aromas coming out of this bourbon that's been in there for, you know, in some cases, a decade plus. Uh, it's a bit of time travel here, going back to when they first filled these. 
and it really starts to get complex at this point. In the 60s and 70s, whiskey got older just because it had to, because they weren't selling it. In our case, we're planning this out at you know nine, 10 years of age. Heck, we're taking into account uh, the housing market, real estate. The reason for that is as real estate trends in price, so too will bourbon because of oak. The same grade of oak that is used for making bourbon barrels is used for making oak flooring. It's cooperage grade oak. So when the housing market is doing really well and more houses are being built, that logger is, he's got a pile of trees that are cooperage grade, but if he puts them in this pile, it goes to real estate or for making flooring, this pile goes to the barrel makers. When real estate's doing well, he's gonna get paid more by sitting it in this pile. What that does, it creates a shortage of oak for barrel makers. So the price per barrel goes up and three, five, seven, ten 10 years down the line, the price of your bottle of bourbon also went up naturally to recoup the cost of that barrel that real estate made us pay extra for. So as we're forecasting, the bourbons that we're going to be releasing nine, 10, 11, 12 years from now, that's something to take into account, the price of the oak and what other markets may have an effect on that. Right now, no matter how much the barrel costs, we can't make it fast enough. It's flying off shelves. We can't make enough whiskey. And accountants have an issue with that. Sometimes they can't understand having to wait nine years, especially with barrels of bourbon. Uh, here in Kentucky, we have a ad valorem real estate tax on every barrel that sits in Kentucky. What that means is they consider the value of that barrel to add to the value of your property. So you will be taxed accordingly. Uh, now this has paved many roads and built many schools in Kentucky with that tax, but you do see people trying to get around that, especially the, the accountants of the world, no offense. Uh, my dad's an accountant, so I get to say that I think, but they don't quite understand where all these taxes go and why we can't say, look at nine years from now and try to map it out in the spreadsheet. It doesn't always work out the best. But with this nine-year-old barrel proof, we do not mean single barrel. That's another term that often gets confused sometimes. When somebody says barrel proof, some people think that that came out of just one barrel. In this case, this is a small batch of barrels that we took in just a few, blended them together, and then didn't add any water. Now, when we had, say, that redemption rye at 92 proof, coming out of the barrel, this whiskey would have been closer to about 114, 115 proof. But that's a bit hot, so we added a bit more water to it to bring it down to a consistent even 92 proof. That's why you can buy a bottle of redemption in New Hampshire and buy a bottle of redemption in California, and they're both 92 proof. It's not because all of the barrels miraculously come out that way to it's exactly 92 proof every time. For paying our taxes, our FET, federal excise tax, we have to be within 0.3 of a proof for it to be legal with what's in the bottle versus what the label says. So they're very tight on that, and that's why we add water to make sure that proof is consistent. Barrel proof, we didn't do any of that. What that means is what it came out of the barrel, that's the proof it is in the bottle. Pure, uncut, it's the closest you can get to putting your lips on a barrel and taking a swig, I like to say. Uh, now, I'm not gonna say I have done that, but this is much simpler. Now, those barrels are heavy. But with barrel proof, we never know really what proof we're gonna get until we've blended the barrels together. In this case, you're looking at 108, yeah, 108.2 proof. In this case, that older barrels going in, 
they were in a more humid environment. And so they actually lost a bit of proof, went into the barrels at 120 proof. Coming out, 108.2, it's the point 0.2 that gets you. But with this 108 proof, that's just what the barrel gave us. So every batch is gonna be slightly different from release to release because the barrels are gonna be different. Where I pulled the barrels from, uh, what humidity was, what the weather was over the course of nine years, it's gonna make a different product. And we can try to blend around that to a degree, but in the end, we only have so much control over mother nature and what she gives us. So each one of these is a special bottling. I have to say that is, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. But it is not just the contents of one barrel. It's not a single barrel. It is barrel proof, but small batch, meaning a blend of some barrels. And with this, it's really concentrated flavor. You're looking at these dark leather, tobacco, a little bit of smoke, touch of campfire, but also sweet as well, because this is still that bourbon recipe. There's only 21% rye in this one. Uh, you're looking at 75% corn, 4% malted barley. So lots of these toffee and vanilla bean as well. And there's a bit of a dark earthy fruitiness and that dark plum coming through. These are just some notes. Uh, not everyone's going to get these. Some people are going to have different notes. These are just some of the ones I found within this batch personally. But barrel proof, as I said, it's just maximum body, maximum flavor, just coating the palate and taking you back in time to nine, 10, 12 years ago when these barrels were being filled and thinking about what you were doing at that time. But with that, that's going to be redemption barrel proof. We've walked through from moving into America to uh, almost modern day. We got through the, the cold, dark times of vodka and gin, and we're able to get back into our nice, delicious whiskey. Well, with that, I'd love to have any other questions you have, and then we've got three more trivia questions for you. So David, I feel like you might have been watching the uh, chat bar because you answered almost all of the questions. Oh, really? You were going through your presentation. So <laughs> I wish I could read that fast. Yep. I think that it just, you know, it was a really good flow, what you were just sharing with us. And a lot of people were curious about learning more. And then as you kept going, you gave them what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't had enough whiskey. Maybe that's why I'm getting a bit more uh, uh, precognition there. Uh, we did have one other question for you. Somebody is curious which redemption product you suggest serving with Thanksgiving dinner this week. Ooh. That's a naughty question. Um, I have to say for a real nice after dinner, sort of a nightcap, I'll be more inclined towards something like the redemption weeded nice like it's still at 96 proof so it's still got some some warmth to it but that sweeter wheat style um you have a lot more um i say maybe some drinkers that haven't had as much experience with the full gamut of what bourbon and rye whiskey have to offer that weeded profile has a tendency to be more appealing but with dinner uh, i'm gonna go rye whiskey all day long uh, with that redemption rye, those big, bold, spicy herbal flavors, it's able to stand up to some of those big, bold uh, flavors that you're going to have in your dinner. You know, I start thinking of the sage in, say, something like your uh, stuffing. Um, that sage is going to play very well with like the caraway seed that I, I pick up in that redemption rye. Or if I'm looking at the you know the turkey the big fatty turkey mouth coating rye is tends to be a bit drier not as sweet as a bourbon so that dry finish of the rye could help to cleanse the palate or cut some of the fat or the the grease from that turkey and it really just helped to offset uh, those characteristics for me yeah with dinner redemption rye Nightcap after redemption weeded. That's be where I'm going. Awesome. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I think that brings us to the rest of trivia time. Absolutely. 
We'll dive right in. We already hit the first couple. Largest producer of rye whiskey, George Washington. Oldest known sour mash recipe dated what year? 1818. Going into the American Revolutionary War, what was the number one imported spirit? All right, guys, I've got the chat up. I'm watching. We've got rum. Is that correct? Rum is correct. We went through quite a bit, 3.7 gallons per capita. Paul, you were the first one to correctly respond. You get a gift card. There we go. I feel a little bit like Oprah tonight. You get a gift card. You get a, <laughs> you gift, get card. a gift card. Uh-huh. Uh, I just, I feel like Oprah because I've been just giving away whiskey all night, I feel like. <laughs> I, I haven't had any myself. Yeah. Mm. Cheers. Yeah. That's some of the weeded there. I'm very happy. Okay. But yes. Rum. All right. We've got two more here. Let's see who's fastest on the keys. What act almost single-handedly caused American rye whiskey to fade away? We've got the Volstead Act. Volstead Act. That's correct. Started Jill. prohibition. Jill, you were the first one to correctly answer. You get a gift card. <laughs> All right. We're, we're moving it around quite a bit. I like it. All right. Last one. What agent can we blame in part for the increase in whiskey age during the 60s and 70s? Oh, 007. <laughs> We're right there. James Bond, 007. Uh, David, sort of how Mad Men that. has helped to bring about more whiskey. James Bond pushed uh, vodka and gin. All right, guys. Congratulations, Tracy, Mark, Paul, Jill, and David. You will be getting gift cards to the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets from Redemption Bourbon. Thank you, guys. Yeah, oh. Cheers to you all. Uh, glad you all are able to come out. I've had a blast. So I would just like to uh, thank everybody for being here tonight. I know I mentioned this at the beginning of the feed, but tonight is our last event before we take a little break for Thanksgiving. We will be back on Monday with Screwball. And then we have an event every night next week. So we're excited. We hope you'll pre-register uh, on our Eventbrite page. If you would like to, uh, if you don't have the link directly to our Eventbrite page, you can visit explore.liquorandwineoutlets.com and see all of our events there. So uh, David, I am just gonna share my screen now because I just wanna share one last thing with everybody. I wanna get the URL up for our 90 Days Around the World site in case anybody would like to go and find out how to download the Passport app and to see uh, other events. So this, the 90 Days website does link off to that site that I just listed for you. Uh, which will take you directly to the correct place on Eventbrite to buy your tickets. It will not buy, excuse me, because they're all free, uh, but just to pre-register so we'll have your email address. It uh, looks like a couple people who had registered registered through the wrong link for tonight's event. So we were having a few people joined us on Facebook who are supposed to be here on Zoom. So we wish that you had been here with us, but don't worry, we'll get you next time. Uh, and so thank you everybody who tuned in tonight. We hope that you guys have been really enjoying these events. Try not to miss us too much on Thanksgiving and on Whiskey Wednesday tomorrow, but we'll be with you in spirit and you can watch all of the replays on our Facebook page. So thanks again to everybody, especially to David. This was an incredible presentation. Not only did we learn a ton about redemption, but about bourbon and, you know, just in general, so much good stuff. No, I will never watch... I'll never watch James Bond the same again. <laughs> and yep. thank you. Whiskey in hand, surely. Thank you to Mark and Robert and Patrick and Shannon, who were also on the line offering support uh, as we were dealing with uh, a couple of people's technical difficulties tonight and with all of our questions. So we're so glad that everybody was able to tune in and we will see you guys again next Monday, November 30th. Have a great hey. Thanksgiving, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers to you all. Have a great night.